All right, welcome everyone who's joining us. Um, we'll just give a minute for um, other colleagues to join us, but as you're coming in, um, you can uh, go ahead and look at the bottom of your screen and choose your language by clicking the globe at the bottom. So there's uh, interpretation today in French or Spanish. So please feel free to go ahead and join that now um, while we wait for other colleagues to join us. All right. Hi, again, welcome everyone. Um, real excited for you to join us for this session um, on empowering field agents and staff in the face of dynamic change. It's a collaborative session. Um, and if you've joined us just a little bit late, please feel free to go ahead and choose your language for interpretation at the bottom of the screen. Um, those uh, instructions are also in the chat box as well. Um, before we get started, we would like to invite you to answer a poll. Um, we should drop that into the chat. There we go, no, it's coming up on your screen. So please feel free to take the next few minutes to answer the questions in this poll so we can get an idea of who's in the room with us attending today. So far, I'm seeing a pretty broad spread of participants, um, a good number of folks coming to us from Sub-Saharan Africa, um, some folks in North America, a good mix of BHA, non-BHA participants today and development and emergency um, practitioners. If you're just coming in, please feel free to answer the poll. We're just getting an idea of who's joining us um, in the session today. And it looks like there's a, a good mix of uh, technical uh, expertise as well, Monitor monitoring evaluation, leadership, program management, um, some field level implementers joining us today, um, as well as technical oversight and operations teams. So this is fantastic. All right, I think everybody's had a chance to answer the poll. So again, I would like to welcome everyone to this session. Um, it's a collaborative session. So hopefully some of you have had a chance to, to experience the format of the collaborative session. We'll be exploring and discussing how decentralized decision-making became a necessity to meet activity needs and how implementing partners adapted in different contexts. So basically, we're going to start out with two short presentations highlighting the practical examples from one from Southeast Asia, um, presented by uh, some colleagues at Catholic Relief Services in Indonesia. Um, and then another example uh, presented by World Vision, their Thrive program in Zambia. Um, and then after that, we're going to break out into smaller discussion groups, depending on the number of participants. Right now, it looks like we have uh, 15 to 20, maybe about 20-ish, 25 participants. Um, so we'll probably break out into two or three breakout rooms, depending on how um, participation uh, changes through the course of the presentations. We may have a few minutes after the presentations for, for questions, but feel free to write your questions in the chat box if you think of something as the presenters are sharing, um, sharing their information. So, First, I'd like to introduce our presenters. 
Um, our first presentation is going to come from Hester Schmidt, Program Quality Manager at Catholic Relief Services, and Aldi Surya, Disaster Relief Program Manager at Human Initiative, who will discuss their work in Sulawesi, Indonesia, um, and talk about enabling conditions that allow for coordination and continued implementation during COVID-19 while increasing local partner responsibility. They'll also discuss the challenges faced as they adapted their implementation approach in response to the continuously changing context. And then the second presentation will be led by Mofat Mtanga, Program Manager for the Transforming Household Resilience in Vulnerable Environment or Thrive Program at World Vision Zambia, who will talk about how the Building Secure Livelihoods model, which is a self-managing approach, allowed Thrive to empower facilitators and volunteers to make implementation decisions to enhance project results. So this approach was especially useful during the COVID-19 pandemic in Zambia. So with that introduction, I'd like to pass it off to Hester and Aldi to start us off with their introduction um, of their program in Sulawesi. Hester? Yes, yes. Hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the session. I'm really excited to have uh, such a mix of people here. Um, so, um, as Jenny explained, um, we'll be presenting um, e an example um, from Central Sulawesi in Indonesia, um, and uh, we'll we'll specifically kind of focus on our experience and in, in how we coordinated a, a kind of emergency re response program um, during the 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 new normal of uh, COVID nineteen. Um, and with me will be um, Aldi Surya, who's um, from our uh, from our partner organization, Human Initiative. Um, so we'll be co-presenting. Next. I'm not seeing the next slide yet. Thank you. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, um, be because it is, uh, it, it is obviously not familiar for everybody. Um, so our project um, was kind of uh, focused on facilitating safe and dignified um, shelter and settlement solutions for, for IDPs um, in a post-disaster situation. Um, and it was being implemented around one and a half years after the disaster um, that struck Central Sulawesi. Um, and um, it was interesting because uh, there were still people at that time living in, in camps. Um, and the picture below kind of illustrates um, their living conditions when we started the project. And as you can see from the picture above, this kind of illustrates the, the, the impact of the disaster, which was um, an earthquake a tsunami and also caused uh, liquefaction, which basically meant that um, there were so many houses and, and a lot of infrastructure that, that kind of sunk into the, into the earth or moved. Um, so CRS together with Human Initiative um, implemented this project and we were also working with um, financial service providers, uh, in this case, the um, the post office and the project was funded by Caritas Germany and it was implemented between November 2019 and December um, 2020. Um, and by the end of the project we were able to facilitate 318 uh, IDP households with cash-based solutions um, to secure better uh, shelter um, shelter environments, um, and we did this through a mixed approach of rental assistance, resettlement, shelter construction, and repair. Um, next. Just before we dive into um, kind of the, the conditions that we were faced with, um, I think this picture very well illustrates the, the, the change and the dynamic that we faced in the field. Um, on the left, you'll see a picture from February 2020. And at that time in Indonesia, there were no confirmed cases of COVID-19 yet. Um, the first confirmed 
case uh, was in March 2020. And by May 2020, there were 600 confirmed cases. Um, and the project kind of adapted to that by, and we'll, we'll explore this further by kind of putting in place um, different, different mechanisms to ensure um, that we were following the right protocols. Next. So um, yeah, we'll be talking about a few enabling conditions uh, in, in, in our project. Um, and to start off, um, one, one of the things that we want to highlight um, is this element of team culture. Um, and for, for the case of uh, our case in Central Sulawesi, what happened was we, it, when COVID-19 started, we really focused on first prioritizing the staff, uh, the safety of staff and partners in the field, as well as the communities being served. Um, so we ensured that there were different things in place to, to do this. Um, and another element was really within the team, although we were all facing a, a risk uh, very potential and obvious risk um, in terms of safety and security. One, one thing that kind of brought us together was really a sense of urgency um, where we were looking at the community that we were, we were trying to help um, and looking at their situation and realizing that without kind of ensuring that we, we continued with this project, the, the families that were still living in tents would be very vulnerable um, to to COVID nineteen as well as other uh, other protracted risks. So this really kind of focused us um, and create and and having that sense of urgency and having that kind of um, drive to to focus on improving their lives and their living conditions really brought us together um, and and focused us on on trying to achieve what we set out um, to achieve from at the start. Um, the other thing with COVID-19 um, when it started is that internally we started um, having discussions around, uh, around well-being. Um, so within the team, we had regular weekly uh, meetings and we, we always, we started raising as one of the items in the agenda, we always had discussions around well-being. And a lot of suggestions also came out through those discussions on, on things that we had to modify, not just in, in day-to-day operations, um, but also in terms of the project context. Um, a lot of that came out from those regular discussions. Um, and also in terms of one-on-ones, we, we started making sure that well-being was, was a point, which was particularly interesting because in this case, we were implementing a project in the field. We had a field office, but staff were also living in the field office. So a lot of the discussions were not just on well-being during work, but also well-being in terms of their, their day-to-day living environments because they were living in the office. Um, and another, another element was really, we had a very, very strong sense of, of togetherness with our partner. We, we felt that there were almost no divisions in terms of um, CRS and the local partner. Um, tasks were much more divided in terms of the, the functions of people. So we had monitoring and evaluation staff uh, of, on the CRS side as well as the partner side. And they were all kind of focusing on, on uh, shared activities and shared outputs. Um, and that really helped us to kind of overcome the challenges that we were we were facing um, with the with COVID nineteen. Um, and yeah, just to add to that, also or in, within CRS, quite soon, I think in in February or maybe even um, yeah, early January, um, there was a lot of effort in terms internally to put together. Um, a lot of resources um, uh, for not just for staff, but also for for partners. Um, and these were different documents on like guidance on how to adapt programming, how to adapt uh, wash programming to the current context, how to adapt 
shelter programming to the current context. There was a lot of guidance that was put out, um, as well as guidance on how do you do distrib cash distributions or NFI uh, distributions within um, the COVID context, and how do you make sure that it's uh, abiding by um, uh, good practices for, for safety and security. Um, so a lot of these resources were put out um, and I think uh, Aldi can touch more on some of the resources that were put out in terms of online trainings and webinar webinar sessions. I'll let Aldi uh, kind of talk about those items. Okay. Thank you, Hester. Yeah, one of uh, the, adapt, uh, the adaptive strategies applied when these COVID issues came out is uh, the development and dissemination of resources that have been told by Hester previously. So uh, yeah, CRS is invest uh, did some investment on the on their level to, to put the resources into the staff and the partner also. So at the time we have uh, so many uh, resources coming from uh, CRS regarding the, uh, including the COVID uh, webinar series at, and also the training, including on the, uh, about the market-based programming, for example. And I think this is a very uh, positive, I mean, uh, positive impact uh, from the COVID-19 because, uh, you know, uh, prior the COVID issues, uh, we are not familiar with the online training. So maybe uh, for the training from the CRS, maybe uh, they mostly circulated inside of the, uh, uh, in terms of on, on, on the offline uh, method it will be more uh, difficult to reach out uh, the partner also uh, because uh, we have the barrier from the from the ge geographical because yeah you know uh, when the when when the uh, online training is introduced to us uh, right now we have the uh, more the capacity building and improvement that can be conducted uh, without geographical barriers uh, as you know the training from the uh, CRS headquarters can uh, we can follow the training also uh, directly uh, in online. So this is uh, very helpful for us to increase our uh, capacity uh, and uh, improve our skills in uh, program management. Uh, and also the next things the, that uh, uh, we learn from the projects uh, uh, in Palu uh, in in West Sula uh, in Central Sulawesi is about the devolved decision making uh, regarding the partner empowerment and collaboration. So this is uh, very uh, interesting also for us because uh, uh, because of this condition that uh, have to force us that. Uh, or have to have to has the the bigger responsibility uh, on the project. So uh, and also uh, we do some uh, because this project is the this is the pilot project for us uh, in in our internal from human initiative because we are not too familiar with this project previously, but. Uh, because of this uh, condition, uh, we have to take the bigger responsibility on this, so we can uh, use our our uh, our uh, previous experience uh, working with CRS in this in this project, and we can uh, able to 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 to, uh, to replicate it in in, the, in the in one of the other uh, project uh, site. And this is very helpful for us uh, because uh, many experience, uh, many uh, many knowledge that we can get uh, from uh, from uh, collaborating with uh, CRS previously, so we can implement it in, in the in the in the uh, new pilot projects, and we take the more bigger responsibility in that. So this is a very uh, help for uh, experience for us and it can improve our capacity in this project and also after this project we are more confident to do the same project in another uh, area uh, over to you Hester. yeah thanks uh, and i think another another important point here is that prior to this um, emergency response uh, initiative 
Um, CRS had already invested uh, through a separate project in building the capacity of our local partners, including Human Initiative. Um, so a, a lot of that capacity was already built and this, this kind of provided an opportunity for the partner to then really take the lead um, in, in one uh, location, as Aldi mentioned. Um, and for CRS then to take a step back and to play more of a mentorship role um, in, in, in that initiative. And one of the things that we did was we, um, from, from my side at that time, I was the team leader. So I established regular meetings to weekly meetings to reflect on the progress and challenges um, with the partner. Um, and to immediately also make decisions on how we were going to mitigate problems. So we did that collectively on a weekly basis. And we, we really went into details. We discussed ev almost every single household that we were dealing with and issues that we're facing, uh, we were facing with, with that. But um, it was very helpful in that way to provide, um, to provide that kind of accompaniment and support uh, to human initiative. Um, the other the other component of it on the CRS side was that while I was uh, the team leader and I also had a colleague as emergency coordinator, um, we both um, had to actually go back to our home base because the, the location of the project was not our home base. And that also meant that we had to put in a system into place where we could appoint somebody else to make the regular day-to-day -day decisions in the field. Um, and also we engaged that person in regular discussions uh, directly with the donor so that everybody was kind of on the, on the same page. Um, and, and relating to that donor engagement, um, we had, our donor was very supportive um, and we, prior to COVID, we had established already also regular bi-weekly meetings with the donor to update them on the situation because it was quite complex with the with the interventions um, the mix of interventions we were providing um, so having that regular online meeting continue um, with COVID it helped us kind of discuss uh, issues that that we were presented with um, during the pandemic um, and also helped us to negotiate flexibility um, around activities um, in the project uh, as, as well as time frames. So um, like, for example, the donor uh, put aside 2000, it wasn't a large amount, but provisionally um, 2000 euros just to, to ensure the staff safety and security aspect of it. Um, so that was very helpful for us to have that donor flexibility. Um, because it allowed us to adapt activities at the at the field level. Next. So moving on to some of the challenges or inhibitors that we faced. Um, one of the things that we were reflecting upon was um, kind of the remote work. Um, as I mentioned briefly, um, we, we were CRS, um, myself and some other colleagues were, were allowed the opportunity to kind of work remotely, um, working from home to kind of continue our roles, but, but through remote work. Um, and we, I, we reflected on this and, and saw that actually, if you're implementing a project in the field, it is difficult for some staff um, to be able to work from home because what does work from home look like when you have a project that is required to have staff in the field with the communities on the day, daily basis. Um, and, you know, how, how does that work? Um, so I think in, in relationship to this, there, there is a kind of, it, it forced us to kind of uh, reflect on the fact that some mid managers um, could mid managers and top managers had the privilege of working from home while a lot of us uh, couldn't, especially because we had a field office and we're also living in the field office. Um, and, and there were some challenges in, in the 
in the work from home um, kind of policies that were that were supported by CRS. Um, because we did encourage staff, even though there were field staff, to as much as possible avoid coming to the office and um, do do work remotely from their homes uh, if they didn't have to be in the field. But at um, internally, there were still mid managers that were calling for in person meetings, even though we had all the tools available to us to do meetings offline. And I think that came from initially from a sense of distrust of knowing you know are are the people who report to me actually working or where are they um so there was that that hurdle to overcome and it requires a kind of shift in in the way you think about work and also um the 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 working culture uh we also had ad, uh, admin staff who kind of were very in, inflexible to changing conditions and and uh changing um changing kind of what we accepted uh, administratively and financially. So it, it was an initial challenge and kind of changing that mindset. Um, so, and, and from an operations side also, uh, the finance team, the finance manage, management who usually did regular field checks and came to the field, they were also faced with um, restrictions in, in travel um, and that meant also that they had to set up mechanisms with the partner to kind of share documents remotely or to post, uh, to send documents via post and, and to do a lot of that work remotely, which also cost more time. Um, so we had to start factoring that into kind of our reporting schedules and our monitoring schedules that this was going to take um, more time. Um, the other elements of kind of the, the work from home and, and, and um, uh, yeah, the work from home in, in conditions where I, as a team leader, was able to stay safely at, in my, my home environment, it also made us reflect on this issue of transferring risk because there, there are people who's, who are frontliners um, and they are more at risk to COVID-19 and other security issues and it is a privilege to um, be able to work from home, but not everybody has that privilege um, because some of their uh, daily work that they need to get done depends on being able to go to the field. Um, so these are kind of the realities that, that I think organ as an organization, we have to uh, start reflecting on. Um, so yeah, I mean, C CRS internally also um, decided that, you know, it was it was really not recommended to travel if it wasn't necessary. But there were people because of the sense of urgency. Um, there were people who wanted to take that risk, and it became very much an individual um, individual choice of whether or not they wanted to take that risk. Um, and unfortunately, we also had to learn the hard way in a more recent disaster response, also with human initiative. Um, that we have to put in place the, the necessary resources because in that, um, in that case, a lot of the frontliners from Human Initiative, they, they, they were infected by COVID-19 um, and they couldn't self-isolate in their field office because we, yeah, I mean, and that, that made us reflect that we should have invested more into ensuring that the office space and the working environment allowed for uh, self isolation um, and and just yeah um, having more resources for for those kind of things um, and I'll pass it on to Aldi uh, to talk a little bit about the local capacity uh, challenges. Okay, thank you, Hester. Yeah, regarding the local capacity context uh, in in this point that uh, we are uh, as most of most of us is. Most of us is the first first responder for uh, implementing these projects, and then uh, there are some overwhelming uh, condition uh, by the staff that we have to carry on the field at that time. Because, uh, uh, for example, about the distribution, normally can uh, we can conduct it uh, 
from 70 to 100 people per day for the distribution, but uh, because of the COVID uh, protocol, uh, maximum uh, people that can we can we uh, distribute is uh, for uh, 10 to 20 people per day. So it's a very overwhelming in the field that we have to do uh, more tasks, uh, including the on-site distribution and monitoring and distribution and also uh, the other tasks and uh, as Hester mentioned before, field officer is almost impossible to work from home remotely because uh, their activity is mostly on the field. So uh, this will be uh, some of the challenge that the challenge that we uh, face at the time. So and the other one is the uh, accessibility from uh, our side to access the community because uh, in every aspects that because we have to. Uh, pay attention to principle of uh, do no harm for them. So uh, we have to uh, do uh, adaptive strategy, uh, including uh, regarding the sensitization for uh, and the capacity building for the local communities. Uh, uh, in normal situation, we can do that uh, in 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 uh, uh, in no worries about the COVID, but is when the COVID uh, issues is came out, uh, we have to adjust our strategy and this will be, uh, uh, will take some more times also to be implemented on the field. And also the other one is regarding the lack of confidence from us as the partner to, to assume the roles and responsibility because uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this is uh, the pilot project for us, uh, but uh, CRR, CRS is already uh, uh, do the, some capacity building on their partners, uh, including the peer project that have been implemented uh, some years ago. So this is very helpful for us. Uh, 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 but uh, there, there are some still same lack of uh, confidence from us because uh, this is uh, actually our pilot project and we have to get the more responsibility uh, responsibilities but uh, uh, crs is very supportive they they also guide us in every uh, project implementation so we can conduct it uh, very well at the end of the project and also the other thing is the regarding the language barrier uh, on the training and the uh, webinar session also because it's all, uh, always conducted uh, in english but uh, some of our staff, uh, they cannot speak English. They have, uh, uh, they have the, the, the difficulties to understand what the, what the uh, presenter said, what the training is about. So this is one of the, of the challenges for, for us also regarding uh, this, uh, this point. Over to you, Hester. Thanks. And, and one other issue in terms of local capacity was um, the financial service provider that we were working with, uh, the post office. They also did not um, kind of, uh, they were not well prepared um, to, to kind of make the adaptations necessary to ensure their customers were, um, were given, you know, hand, they, were, they weren't necessarily, um, all of them could provide hand washing stations um, and, Kind of these these means to secure the safety um, of their customers. Um, so we were originally working with uh, a branch of the post office, and they just weren't able to do the adaptation measures that we were required. Plus, because of COVID nineteen, suddenly the government was uh, providing lots of cash assistance through the post office. Um, and they couldn't manage um, all the, they were just overwhelmed by all the amounts of cash that they had to distribute from the government aid plus our, plus CRS's project and other um, NGO projects. So we ended up shifting back to the, the headquarters of the post office in, in the province, which did mean that for community members, they had to travel a little bit further. Um, but these are, these are important things to reflect on, um, on how our adaptations uh, might have an impact on, um, on the communities that, that we're working with. Um, and then just the last point about program quality, as Aldi mentioned, um, it, the, the, the adaptations that we had to do also 
meant that we had to kind of slow down in, in some of our um, activities and approaches like the cash distribution. It went from, as he mentioned, 100 per day to just 20, being able to serve 20 households per day. Um, the other aspect was that um, kind of the, the cash-based approach that we were um, that we were implementing had assumed that community members would be able to contribute their own resources, whether or not in kind or um, or financially, um, to building transitional shelters. Um, and given COVID, their own social economic conditions were affected by the pandemic, um, which also meant they, that they weren't able to contribute as much um, as we had expected at the start. So it meant that some of the initial assumptions that we had at the beginning of the project um, changed and we needed to continuously monitor that. And we, we, we were able to do that and we were able to, um, to also um, leverage uh, the donor in terms of being more flexible and, and kind of increasing the cash amounts that we were uh, provided, although they were still directed towards uh, shelter. Um, we did increase that because we, we, we understood that the community themselves were going through um, uh, a serious crisis, not just a health crisis, but a, a social economic crisis as well. Um, but it did affect um, some aspects of the program quality. So these are um, from our side. Um, we'll, we'll be ending the, the presentation from our side. Um, and I hope that some of the things that we mentioned um, kind of trigger some ideas for, for the discussion later. Um, and yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Hester. Um, so yes, uh, we don't have time for questions and answers. We're running a little bit over, about 10 minutes over. So if you have questions for Hester and Adi, please put those in the chat and they can, they can field those in the chat box. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Moffat to take the floor and please uh, start your presentation um, and, and be mindful of time so that we have some good time for discussion um, in the last portion of this session. So please take the floor and share with us your case in Zambia. Thank you very much, Jane. And uh, um, um, I'd want to uh, start by saying that um, um, I'm going to present on, on World Vision Zambia um, and specifically on the Thrive Project and how we, this project uh, um, supported us to remain um, resilient even during the COVID-19. So um, maybe just to give a brief background. So um, for some of our colleagues that do not know where Zambia is, so Zambia is, located, is a landlocked country uh, located in the south, southern central of Africa. Um, we are a population of about 18 million people. Uh, we ex first experienced our um, COVID, uh, uh, recorded our COVID uh, positive case in March 2020. And uh, we went on to experience the first wave, the second wave, and now we are currently experiencing the third wave. Um, despite um, the country not uh, going through a, a full lockdown, we had um, um, gatherings and uh, movement restricted uh, to, to avoid uh, the spread of the, the, the virus. And um, immediately that uh, was, uh, the, that direction was given by the government. World Vision quickly uh, established a COVID-19 protocol for staff and uh, communities, um, as well as a response team was actually deployed to ensure that uh, there was adherence to the protocols that were put in place, as well as um, guide uh, field implementation. So the Thrive uh, uh, programming um, progressed on well, of course, cautiously. And um, um, using the Building Secure Lively model, we were able to actually prove to, to that uh, this model was actually resilient um, when faced with uh, a pandemic like the COVID-19. Uh, next slide. 
So, um, so why the, the BSO model? So um, the BSO model in itself is actually a, a resilient uh, model that focuses on uh, building um, uh, secure livelihoods for the marginal poor. In this case, we were talking of 15,000 small order farmers that uh, we are working with. And uh, these are farmers that are living uh, around the poverty line of about a dollar. Uh, 90 a day and um, the model actually uh, tries to focus on strengthening the system um, by promoting uh, self uh, governing uh, small units within the communities where we have um, uh, a group of 20 to 55 people coming together and uh, working as as a unit and um, uh, and they're able to select um, uh, uh, a leader, in this case, who we call a champion, or you may want to call them uh, a PIU leaders. And these are people that spearhead uh, the, the implementation of, of, of the project uh, at the field level. So these, these, these uh, keep records of uh, the, the, the farmers that they are, they are working with, their follower farmers, and they liaise with uh, government, government uh, partners as well as uh, World Vision staff to ensure that uh, they are actually implementing the, 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 the model according to, to the standard and following the, the sequencing of interventions as uh, guided by the, by the model. So what you're seeing on, this, on the screen there is just uh, an example of how these uh, PIUs are, are structured in the field. So we, like in our case here, we have over uh, 15,000 uh, small order farmers that are participating in this model, and they are actually grouped in uh, small groupings of uh, 20 to 55. And in our case, we actually recommended uh, 25 as, as the max uh, uh, number of uh, farmers to be in a, uh, a PIU. Um, and all, all the interventions are actually at, are done at that smaller unit. We can we can move to the next slide. Okay, so um, at the heart of uh, this this model that I, I, I just sh uh, showed in the previous screen is uh, uh, an empowered um, mindset. So we 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 focus on uh, empowering the mindset of. Uh, the facilitators, uh, uh, this means this includes uh, World Vision staff, uh, uh, volunteers, the community volunteers, as well as uh, the, the beneficiaries uh, themselves. So um, we are using an approach called what, what, which we call the empowered uh, worldview. So this, this model actually challenges uh, the inequitable uh, social norms as well as uh, tries to help uh, people transform their minds um, to, for them to have a strong character and uh, it, it encourages them to use uh, the, their individual uh, abilities to, to make decisions that empowers them and helps them to improve their well-being or the environment in which uh, they, they, are, they are found. Um, um, apart from that, uh, because of an empowered mind, um, we, we actually, uh, the, the, the facilitators themselves, the World Vision facilitators, including the community facilitators, undergo through the, the, the community facilitation uh, 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 training, um, which is basically the BSO model on how we would want this model to be facilitated because it's a community-led model. And, uh, and as such, we, we train all our facilitators uh, in this uh, community facilitation. Um, the, the, the PIU leaders and uh, World Vision staff have the opportunity to be trained in all our core models that we are we use for implement, implementing the, the, the BSO model. So we have models like the, the same empowered worldview, the savings for transformation, uh, microfinance and uh, farmer managed natural regeneration. And these models, like I mentioned, they, they are implemented at that smaller unit led by uh, the PIU leader. 
Um, we also, um, uh, on the project, are promoting a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So we have mentors within the, the programs that carry on one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship with the project uh, participants. And, and, and this in itself uh, helps um, um, uh, uh, to ensure that there is, um, uh, observe, we are observing actually it helps for the facilitators, the mentors to actually begin to um, observe the COVID uh, uh, protocols. And uh, this helped us actually, even at the time when COVID came, because this was already in motion, it was easy to actually implement the models or the protocols that were actually put in place. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so like, like I mentioned, um, yeah, there's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship and uh, this mentorship is actually done in, in, uh, uh, in small groupings, the PIUs, and these PIUs are actually focusing on um, uh, 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 production of uh, a value chain, like, like you can see in, in this photo there, uh, uh, this is one of our project participants that is participating in a, in a value chain uh, uh, of onion. And, um, and, 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 and you can see that uh, through these interventions, they were able to actually uh, continue with their production. What else helped us during the, this is that uh, because uh, PIUs are empowered and they have, uh, uh, they have the skills, we actually had to develop uh, um, uh, WhatsApp groups uh, because there was restricted movements and staff were, would no longer move to the field. We utilize the WhatsApp groups to communicate information with uh, the PIUs just to give them guidance on certain things that they needed to, to implement. Um, we also utilize uh, uh, radio for mass communication, like uh, for programs um, that uh, required uh, mass uh, broadcasting. We, we were able to work with radio stations where we sponsored programs that were providing information on agronomic practices, also information on marketing, and uh, the PIU leaders would then pick that information and um, sit with their groupings and digest that information and plan according to the information that is coming through the mass communication, which was the radio. We also had the weekly uh, Tekken committee with uh, the Tekken co specialists. So the field facing staff would have uh, would uh, would sit with uh, Tekken co specialists online and just to review how their work uh, progressed and learn from one another and see how we, uh, where there were uh, technical uh, gaps and uh, s uh, supported them to uh, help them um, move on. We also provided for uh, uh, protective, uh, personal protective equipment for all the field uh, facing staff, including the volunteers. And, and this uh, supported us to ensure that uh, we did not um, contribute to widespread of uh, the virus. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of uh, the farmers um, uh, that were determined to continue despite having um, the pandemic. We have one farmer, Patrick Mwasa, who actually commented to say, despite I know there's COVID-19, I'm determined to uh, continue with uh, my farming. Next slide, please. So um, with all these uh, measures that were put in place and uh, because uh, the model, the way it is designed and the way it was implemented, we see to it that even when there was um, uh, there's, there was those, the COVID guidelines given, which uh, prohibited gatherings and restricted movements, um, we still had uh, our, our, our volunteers, the community volunteers, continuing implementing the, the, the model because they already had the capacity in them to implement the model. So we, we're actually seeing to it that uh, there was actually more production that was going on within the, the community themselves. They were able to share uh, ideas, they were, going to, they were able to learn, they were able to communicate, 
and they were able to even uh, organize themselves into cooperatives. Um, I'll give an example of one cooperative in, in the northern where they are doing the onion value chain. They actually managed to register the cooperative. They went on to uh, even uh, um, do uh, get uh, uh, access market through the commercial uh, um, uh, the commercial producer groups, and um, they were able to sell their produce to even supermarkets without uh, much disruption, with very little support that came through uh, ourselves, like uh, on face-to-face -face going to the field, but through the platforms and the capacity that they had, we were able to support them and they actually continued with uh, implementing the project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just one of our, our project participants showing a field during the COVID-19 uh, time. We can move on to the next slide. Uh, harvest, uh, just, just to demonstrate uh, that our, the farmers were able to continue with uh, production. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so what were some of the constraints? So, um, yes, the farmers were, and the, the leaders, the, the project implementation unit leaders, they, were, they had the capacity, but we still needed to continue building their capacity. But because of uh, limited um, um, or restrictions, we were able to, and we did try to use uh, other technologies like Zoom and, uh, and, 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 and the other platform. This could not work because um, most of our people had uh, limited access to this kind of uh, technology. So we could not really advance in terms of uh, building their capacity uh, because of limited limitation in, in uh, technologies. Uh, there was also the misbelief and misconception about COVID, uh, especially in the rural areas, um, especially the early early days of COVID. Um, so even where we we were allowed to meet, like in the smaller PIUs, where we were allowed to meet even up to twenty people, um, people could not really follow the protocols that were put across, and as such, it was very difficult for um, the the PIU leaders to continue with uh, certain intervention and activities. Uh, yeah, and also fear of uncertainty. I think there was a lot of uncertainty um, surrounding COVID-19. Um, um, we had uh, restrictions that came through and limited information. And it made that uh, when making decisions, for example, even during the marketing season, we, uh, prices kept on fluctuating and, and it was very difficult for the PIUs to even convince uh, uh, their followers to do certain things. Also, where we needed to seek approvals, I think there were some delays in, in approving, like um, we needed to get clearance from uh, the Minister of uh, Health to hold uh, certain uh, um, gatherings. We, we saw to it that uh, there was a, a bit of delayed and that also, um, inhibited us to uh, proceed with uh, doing certain things. So um, I would end my presentation here. Um, sorry, because of time, I was trying to rush through my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Mofat. That was a very interesting presentation. Again, if you have questions for Mofat on this presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat um, and he can field those there. But to save time for um, some lively discussion and breakout rooms, we're gonna move on to that section of our, um, of our session. Uh, with a number of participants, we've composed three groups um, to discuss the same questions. The questions are on the slide there. Um, <clears throat> for time's sake, um, I would encourage uh, each room to combine the first two questions and discuss the enabler, enablers and inhibitors that were mentioned by the presenters that resonate with you, with, um, with your project, the experience that you've had. Um, and then also consider the enables, enablers and inhibitors that maybe you or your team have experienced um, that were not mentioned by the presenters. So we wanna consider what those enablers and inhibitors are um, to empowering staff and volunteers um, in their work. 
Um, and then the last question, based on those experiences presented and discussed, what are the strategies or actions that programs can consider implementing or taking forward to better prepare programs for empowered decision making by staff and volunteers during potential future crises characterized by dynamic change. So we would like um, the groups to come together and discuss these, these particular questions. Um, we have note takers in each of the rooms and two co-facilitators in each of the rooms. Um, the breakout rooms will not have simultaneous interpretation um, like the main session, but if you wish to speak and share anything with the group and you need interpretation, please don't hesitate to ask for help from an interpret interpreter in the room. Um, and with that, uh, so that we can get started on, on the, the meat of this session, let's go ahead and head over to our breakout rooms um, and have some lively discussion. We'll see you in about um, 25 to 30 minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope that you guys had some lively discussion in your groups. Um, we don't have much time left, so I'm not going, we're not going to review the notes, but I just want to assure you that the team will review the notes and we are planning to put together um, at least a brief that we can make available to people through the FSN network. Um, but before we close the session, uh, we want to share in the chat a brief survey that may already be up. I'm not sure yet, but it will drop down in there. There you go. If you could please um, fill out that survey before you leave and let us know um, how you felt about the session and help us continuing help us to continue to improve um, our our service delivery to you guys, implementing partners out there doing all of this fantastic work. I'd also like to thank the presenters again for two really fantastic presentations um, to build off of for our discussions. Also the facilitators and note takers for your guidance and help throughout the session. Um, do we wanna, are we gonna do, sorry, I just wanna ask, are we gonna do a big picture um, here before we go? <laughs> Suzanne, I know that this hey, is- I'm actually going to activate my camera and invite everyone to do so. And that's what I thought. So uh, a time-honored tradition is to have a big group photo of all the folks who are here with us. So please turn on your cameras um, so that we can see your beautiful, beautiful faces and we can commemorate this moment in time. Thank you all. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and participating. We are very gra grateful that you have come to join us. Please enjoy the rest of the sessions that you come, that you are um, going to see today and tomorrow. And have a wonderful day or evening. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.